SJC 12393, Commonwealth v. Benjamin Martinez. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Baylor. Good morning. Uh, may it please the court, Jeffrey Baylor for Benjamin Martinez. Um, first off, we contend here that certain third party culprit evidence should have been admitted. Um, first, evidence relating to the so called Dominican brothers. Uh, Mr. Martinez sought to introduce this evidence to show that the killing was actually uh, a, a result uh, of revenge based on the actions of the decedent's boyfriend and the father of her children. Uh, they, uh, Martinez attempt, uh, attempted to introduce um, police reports in which uh, Roberto Colon, who was the boyfriend, told police that he believed that the brothers had killed uh, the decedent uh, uh, it, for revenge. He so you talked- got, You got, uh, Mr. Bailey, you got two levels of hearsay there. Right. Um, and, and, and you know you need uh, a number of things, including other substantial links to get the, the hearsay in under uh, third party culprit. And um, you don't have, uh, any evidence really beyond, um, beyond uh, uh, motive. And perhaps most importantly, you've got somebody in the apartment, Mr. Guzman. Um, you've got somebody in the apartment who uh, is the actual third party culprit who comes out uh, through the testimony of the defendant. How does allowing this second level here say um, with no other evidence other than uh, uh, motive available, not uh, uh, confuse the jury, never mind getting to the hearsay with other substantial links. Well, um, first off, Guzman was just brought up in the testimony of Martinez. So may, Martinez may well not have even testified if this, uh, if this third party culprit evidence was allowed in. Well, you know? I, 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 I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's a very good point. It doesn't really get developed in your brief and it doesn't get responded to by the Commonwealth, but, but that's, a, that, that's a really good point. The, the response to it is um, he's got to testify his, his DNA is under the victim's fingernails. Right. That's true, but it could have been argued like in, in the cases that I cite in my 33E argument that just because DNA was present doesn't mean that Martinez was the killer. I mean, similar to cases where fingerprints were found at the scene or- No, that's a good point. I agree with you. I'm just responding to um, that, uh, geez, maybe he wouldn't have testified if he got this other third party culprit evidence in and we wouldn't have heard all about Mr. Guzman. And, right. I'm, just, and I'm just saying his DNA is under the fingernails. It's pretty, it's pretty tough when you're saying one in, in five quintillion not to take a, a walk to the uh, witness stand. Right, well, the jury could have concluded that he was there, but not based on, but could have found that just based on this DNA, it was not sufficient to show that he was the actual killer. Um, and even if Martinez did testify about Guzman, if the jury heard all this third party uh, culprit evidence, they may well have concluded that Guzman was the person who actually killed her because there was pe people with motive and opportunity beyond the defendant to, uh, to kill her. Is, is Guzman the same person as uh, Ramon Rivera? No, uh, okay. it's Alexi Guzman. Um, uh, I know that the names, are, there's an Alex and and then Alexi, no, he's not the same as Ramon Rivera. Um, Alexi Guzman was um, uh, a friend of, of the decedents and uh, he, he disappeared after this, uh, after this incident. And, and just to point out that this incident occurred in 2004 and there was, Martinez was not implicated until a CODIS hit in 2014. So, he didn't even have the, an opportunity to really investigate uh, any of this underlying evidence relating to the third parties because it was 10 years after, uh, after the offense. 
Um, and we contend that there, there was um, substantial connecting links um, to the brothers, even if you look beyond the, the testimony, uh, I mean, the statements of Colon and Rivera and Zapata, um, the, the decedent had a sig significant knife wounds in the face, which were similar to those uh, of Colon. Um, um, the brothers and the decedent were both drug dealers in the area. Police even found a photo in the apartment labeled uh, labeled as one of the brothers in, in the decedent's apartment. Uh, and moreover, neighbors saw two individuals leaving the scene, um, uh, which would have uh, shown that the brothers were involved. Well, that, that's leaving a lot of information out. They've got no blood on them. They've, uh, they're, they're, it's in the middle of the day. They look like they uh, practically just took a shower. And, right. And the scar, um, as it relates to, uh, to um, the boyfriend um, in the face, compared, Cologne, compared to 30-plus uh, stab wounds to uh, the victim, I'm not sure that fits so nicely. Well, the major wound was a slash across the face of, of the decedent. Um, it, also, uh, there was three witnesses who, who were telling police that the, the, uh, that the brothers were the, the killers. Um, Cologne out outlined this incident at Chicopee where he assaulted one of the brothers. He subsequently was shot and cut uh, by the brothers in the Dominican Republic. Then he returned to uh, Massachusetts and he was told that the brothers would kill him. Um, the decedent said that this was the reason that they might kill, kill him. And also the decedent told Cologne that uh, the brothers had stolen drugs and money and that she told the brothers family about this and they were angry with her. Um, and finally, she purchased heroin from, um, from uh, an associate of the brothers. So just based on Cologne's uh, statement, there was a, a, a substantial probative value that the, the brothers actually uh, did the killing uh, for revenge. And this was backed up by Rivera's statement to police where he, had, he said he had heard about the, the stabbing and the shooting and that people were telling the decedent to move out of the house. And finally, we have Zapata, who, who talked about the word out was that the brothers killed her because of the Chicopee incident. And- Now, uh, Rivera just, doesn't testify, Boyd. Sorry? Ramon Rivera, does he testify? No. Okay, um, so that's, that, that's two levels of hearsay. And then for Zapata, he wasn't in Chicopee. He has no personal knowledge. He, he, um, he told police that Cologne asked him to participate in the offense and that he was the one who gave Cologne a gun. Right, but he, he wasn't in Chicopee when the event occurred that he's- No, he was, he was not. And, and also, police testified that this seemed like a viable story at the time. Um, so we contend that, that well, and even if there was a hearsay problem here, this evidence wasn't admitted for Bowdoin purposes either. And Bowdoin, of course, gets rid of any hearsay question because it's not introduced for the truth of the matter, but introduced to show that police didn't properly investigate. In these three statements, police testified that this is what the witnesses told them. So there's no question that police knew about it. And uh, if this evidence was, was introduced to show, um, at least to show Bowdoin, um, the jury may well have concluded that the investigation didn't go far enough. For example, the photograph that was found in, in, uh, in uh, the decedent's apartment that, that was labeled as one of the brothers, police did not know who, who told them that that was one of the brothers. I, th I have a question, it's a little bit, I don't think anybody addressed it, but maybe it makes a difference here. You cited to Commonwealth versus Moore in, in, in talking about third party culprit. And you referenced uh, uh, in Moore, there's a uh, footnote. I think Moore is a 2019 case. 
that says that Silva Santiago was wrong about the balance of probative value and undue prejudice. In fact, the appropriate uh, um, balance would in order to your client's uh, benefit. Um, do, do, do you get um, that standard as we review here, Bowdoin, or do we use the Silva Santiago standard? Um. I'm sorry, I, I don't recall what uh, what was the court said in Moore, but of course, if it's Moore. Moore, Moore said that uh, that, that uh, Silva Santiago's probative value has to exceed undue prejudice, actually, that it's a standard in favor of admissibility. The Bowdoin is admitted unless the probative value is substantially outweighed by the undue prejudice. Right, which is right, yes. Much better for your client. Yes, that's that's exactly the standard we, we contend should be applied, that the probative weight outweigh the outweigh the prejudice. Um, That's not what you want. You want the opposite of that. I want the opposite. <laughs> that um, you, the prejudice was okay. Um, sorry. So we contend that at least this evidence should have been admitted for police investigation. And again, um, being so long after the offense, this was the only evidence that uh, that Martinez, you know had he could not go and, and and find these witnesses police even said that they they look for them in in cologne is probably out of the country many of these people were illegally in this country and likely returned to the dominican republic you make an argument concerning jury instructions where yes. the, the error might not really matter in many cases if it is if it, indeed it is even error but but here your concern is in dealing with credibility that the judge did not say something along the lines of your disbelief of a witness is not proof that it, something didn't happen. You have to look elsewhere in the evidence. Well, not saying that in a jury instruction in probably 99% of the cases isn't going to create a substantial likelihood of miscarriage of justice. But I think your argument here is that, that you know, the jury might have just thought that your client's story was, uh, was pretty, uh, far-fetched, but that, that's, that doesn't mean that the Commonwealth's uh, witnesses should be credited or that the case has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, I, I thought in this particular case, that was a pretty good argument. Well, can, can, I, can I ask you a question about that, Mr. Baylor? Sure. After you accept that, congratulations. Um, <laughs> the, 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 um, on, on, on that, you, you cite a case that stands for sufficiency of evidence. Do we have any cases that say that's a required instruction, given all the other instructions that deal with burdens of proof? I, I, I did not come across a case that said that. However, it is in the model jury instructions. It's the, it's it's, the it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's in a, a district court instruction, right? right. No, not in the superior court so-called model to, instructions. It's in a district court one. It seems right? to me that the instruction, this is the instruction that was used by the trial judge. I mean, it tracks it tracks that model instruction. Right, but we, have, some, have, we, have, we, have we ever said that a judge uh, errs because they don't fall? I think we've said the opposite. If they're tracking along a model instruction, other than the homicide instructions, of course, um, that we haven't adopted, if the person deviates from the model instructions, albeit the district court ones in this case, it's not error as long as the proper legal uh, principles are conveyed to the jury, correct? True, yes. But uh, we contend that without that uh, final part of the instruction, it allowed the uh, jury to base their verdict just on, on speculation. They said that they were told that they had to resolve conflicts and determine where the truth lies and that they could disbelieve uh, witnesses. So that may well have left the jury with the impression that they had to resolve conflicts. And if there was no uh, evidence on the other side, then that's that's the resolution. They should believe whatever uh, when there's no evidence on the other side. But ultimately, there was an instruction that they had to find uh, the defendant's guilt um, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Right. Okay. But, and that they speculate, engage, and surmise, etc. Correct. Right. But this, but we contend that this, the jury wouldn't have have necessarily related to. Um, the beyond a reasonable doubt, because they're, they're saying on the first level, if there's a conflict, um, it has to be resolved by the jury. 
and that if they dis in they can disbelieve the witnesses. Well, the next part of the instruction would have said, um, disbelief is an evidence that something occurred. And without that, we contend that the jury um, would could just weigh the evidence. And if there wasn't any on the other side, then they may well have credited it because that's because that's what they weighed. Um, the the, the um, errors by the trial judge on the uh, state of mind testimony. Um, it, it, it sort of gets to an issue that permeates this whole case that I mentioned before. It's the DNA of your client under the victim's uh, fingernails. Um, and um, how, do, how, do you, um, how do you address why that, that error caused prejudice? Because I think there was an objection there, wasn't there? That's preserved, isn't it? There was a request for um, uh, the mental impairment and the judge said that, is this the, the, the one that we're talking about? No, I'm not talking about the intoxication um, yes. instruction. I'm talking about the error that the judge made that the Commonwealth concedes on the state of mind hearsay. Oh, yes. Okay. And, and, and I'm asking you, that was preserved, the wasn't it? Yes. The yeah. prejudice is that this was the only evidence that would have gone to Guzman's state of mind during the alleged attack that uh, Martinez testi testified about. Um, well, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to get at. How okay. could that be? Martinez basically says he's got, you know, he's got no clothes on or something like that, except for socks and and he comments about, he feels like, uh, you know, somebody who's, I don't know, gone into an apartment of uh, husband and wife and gets, gets caught. And then he testifies that uh, Guzman is going to take the victim to the hospital. And, you know, you're not talking about some other witness. It's the defendant testifying to the hearsay or would have testified to the uh, state of mind. Right. But the de defendant testifies to the conclusion, so you don't lose any weight there. How can that create prejudice? Because Martinez is just saying what he believes. He's, he's saying that he thought that, uh, that uh, Guzman was jealous and so on. But these are statements actually from Guzman showing what Guzman's state of mind was. So had the jury heard this, they may well have concluded that, uh, that Guzman had motive and that he he was trying to cover it up by saying that he would take the decedent the, the to the hospital. And of course, uh, she never was. Um, beyond that, I'd like to talk about the, the mental impairment instruction. Um, my reading, the Commonwealth also concedes that the, the lack of the mental impairment instruction was, uh, was an error, but, but argues that it was harmless. Um, the, the, trial counsel asked for mental impairment instruction. The trial judge said that he would give them, and he did give them in terms of the, the prongs of intent, but he did not give it um, uh, relating to the canine factors. Uh, and this court has found that um, mental impairment should be considered by the jury as part of its uh, uh, look at canine factors. It does, so, does it matter when you have that many stab wounds, Mr. Baylor? on prejudice? No, because it comes out, if he was mentally impaired, you know, regardless of, of what the wounds might be. Because mental impairment only goes to two of the canine factors, right? Well, I, I believe that they can, they can look, the jury looks at um, all of them together and then has to find what that at least one was, was present. Um, so we contend that, that um, Right. Okay. So even if it did, if, for example, the one relating to his in, intent uh, to do harm or, or whatever the, the prong was, yeah. So the, the jury could have come back on just that one prong. They don't have to come back on, on the number of wounds or anything. They look at each one and only have to find one. So even if the mental impairment only bore on one of the, the prongs of uh, the factors of canine, that would be enough to, for an error that, that was harmful. Um, and I just, as, as I mentioned before, um, the, the evidence in this case, 
just relied on the DNA. Um, and we contend that if this evidence was sufficient, at least uh, this is a case for uh, a 33E determination. Um, and again, this Mr. Uh, Martinez wasn't implicated for 10 years after, after this uh, incident. And therefore, a lot of even possible... The face of a, even in the face of a brutal and heinous stabbing, it's 33 years? Well, looking at the evidence and uh, the strength of the evidence in light of the end in these other uh, alleged errors, uh, we contend that, that, yes, there is a 33 E uh, um, claim here. It's not a question of the number of wounds. It's a question of whether or not he was the one who actually did the stabbing. It's not just the thank, DNA. Thank the defendant's testimony puts him in the apartment at the time of the killing, and he doesn't just have you know the blood on him when he allegedly gets between the uh, alleged third party culprit and the victim, but it's again, I'm sorry to say this again, the blood's under his fingernails. Right, well, he also testified that he was bleeding uh, while he was trying to, while he was injecting heroin and that the decedent came and helped him clean up. So it, it may well have been deposited then, but also that he um, was injured during the fight between Guzman and Puente. So his blood may, you know, could have been deposited uh, for any number of reasons. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Good morning, may it please the court. Travis Lynch, Assistant District Attorney on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, regarding, just to save a bit of time on research in the future, regarding the uh, credibility instruction, um, based upon what I've, I, I apologize for not putting this in, in the brief, I didn't uh, have space and it, it seemed pretty clear that there's no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice, but just for your, um, it seems as though the district court traces that instruction back to Commonwealth v. Swartz, and the site for that is 343 Mass 709. Um, and I think someone might have hinted earlier that that idea of discrediting a witness is not evidence of the contrary, it might be a sufficiency claim. And in Swartz, this court uses that language in the context of discussing a sufficiency challenge, not a, um, it, it doesn't seem to be an instruction, but the district court treats it as an instruction, um, or it did for a period of time. And I believe that a more recent edition of the district court model jury instructions doesn't have that um, language in it anymore. In any event, as it has been suggested by other justices earlier during this argument, there's no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage or yeah, of a miscarriage of justice because the jury were told the entire burden is on the Commonwealth. And they were told, do not speculate about, uh, don't speculate about whether the defendant's guilty. So they wouldn't have taken the absence of that instruction to allow them to convict the defendant just because they didn't believe him. Um, with respect to the voluntary intoxication instruction, just to stay on the instructional issues, there's no evidence that the defendant was intoxicated the only evidence that he had any heroin comes from him when he says that he was testing the heroin, but it seems as though it was a botched heroin injection because he didn't, he couldn't find the vein. And then he injected a small, I take his testimony to be he injected a small amount and he felt the burning sensation, but he didn't, he doesn't even say that he was high or anything or that he was affected other than the pain. Um, so there's no evidence of impairment on this on this record and the commonwealth's position is that the instruction shouldn't have been given in the first place so there's no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice because this aspect of the instruction was wrong because there's no evidence of intoxication the defendant got more than what he was entitled to in the first place and that and on that issue and also the defendant's defense in this case was third party culprit not diminished capacity and i understand that the defendant might be trying to ride two horses into battle at once now, and I think he's trying to do that on appeal, and I understand that, but there's just no evidence that he was intoxicated. So the error in the instruction, again, on an unpreserved claim, does not give a basis to reverse the, the conviction. Um, to address the other issue that the defendant discusses in the reply brief relating to 
the excluded evidence of certain things that the third, the alleged third party culprit said. Um, I think, I think that, I think various justices have pointed out why there's no prejudice with respect to the um, defendant wanting to say that Alexi was accusing the third party culprit of, or sorry, that the third party culprit was accusing the victim of infidelity because the defendant said he felt awkward. He said he was wearing his, his booty socks um, while the victim was holding his arm. He, he said earlier, I shouldn't have been there. I felt like I just got caught by someone's husband with my wife. Um, and all those, those record sites are all in the brief, but, um, and at various other times, he says that Alexi is angry at the third, at the victim. Um, he says there's animosity. Um, and then later during cross-examination at volume seven, 131, the defendant says that Alexi was angry about money because there was also an aspect of the defendant feeling awkward based upon the fact that the third, the Alexi was his drug dealer. Um, so again, hearing the exact words that the third party culprit addressed to the victim at some point during this meeting does not help the defendant um, where the overall gist of it came through that Alexi was angry. Um, and again, as Justice Lowy kept astutely pointing out, the defendant's DNA is under the victim's fingernails. Um, the other point was that Alexi Guzman, the, the statement by Guzman that uh, I'll take her to the hospital, that came in at volume seven, um, page 131, line 22. The defendant says, he said he was bringing her to the hospital. So there's no error on, or there's, sorry, there's no prejudicial error from that being excluded on the defendant's direct testimony when it came in on cross. Um, Mr. Lynch, uh, if we could go to uh, what might be uh, Mr. Baylor's main point though, uh, and specifically about the Dominican brothers. Um, obviously uh, the third party culprit uh, evidence if it satisfies everything else has has some relevance and Mr. Baylor says that uh, the uh, substantial connecting links is the similarity of the scar Ms. Vega and other witnesses uh, uh, seeing two Hispanic males uh, leaving the house about noon on the day of the murder you've got the victim's boyfriend Mr. Cologne involved in a uh, home invasion or attack on one of the Dominican brothers and actually involved in torturing him. And um, so uh, why doesn't that um, uh, satisfy third party culprit? It doesn't satisfy third party culprit because, um, well, what, they, what the police actually find inside of the, I think it's just important to point out, the Chicopee incident, the police are responding to juveniles kicking in a door on a, on a, on a house. And then Cologne happens to be parked outside of the house that, they are, that the police are responding to. There's, no one actually puts Cologne in that house. And the, the inference that the defendant would draw is that the resident of the house who was the victim of a breaking and entering or something was, I believe it was Julio. Um, but again, the police don't find any evidence that there was torture going on in that apartment. They don't find blood or anything. They don't even find anyone inside of the apartment. Um, so I think you have to, it, it, I would just say that it's speculative to say that the incident in Chicopee that ha that's the subject of the various police reports, I mean, there's, there's very little to connect that with, with, with this case because we don't even find the resident of the apartment. We don't find the victim of the, of the breaking and entering. Um, so, and also just to go back to the other point that was made, 
a stab, a cut to the face and a gunshot wound to the leg, which is what Cologne said he suffered at the hands of the Dominican brothers or someone in Santo Domingo while he was deported there is not at all similar to 32 sharp force injuries. Because one, there's a shooting which is completely different. And two, as I understood what Cologne said, he only got cut once in the face. And here, there's a lot of stab wounds. And also, the other point that I would make is um, attacking someone with a knife is unfortunately not a very distinctive manner of attacking people. So it's not similar and stabbing is not distinctive. So that's my attempt to answer your question. Why that? And, and also at the end of the day, as we're going to keep coming back to, the defendant's DNA is under her fingernails his blood is in the sink. His blood is on the discarded clothing. And the jury heard and rejected a non-speculative third-party culprit defense by the defendant, of course, but nevertheless, they heard and rejected a third-party culprit defense. And I don't think that they would have accepted this one either. And I think we can say that beyond reasonable doubt. So again, there's no error, but even if there were, it doesn't make a difference on the specific facts of this case. And unless there are any further you, questions. Yeah, just, just one question, perhaps. Sure. What do you say about the error on the, um, the instruction regarding diminished capacity and uh, atrocity and cruelty? Oh, um, I think I talked about that earlier. But just to um, reiterate, uh, the defense, so the defendant's defense here is that he didn't commit the, that he didn't kill the victim. So uh, an instruction that's only relevant, the diminished capacity defense only is important where the defendant is saying, yes, I did, I did the act, but I didn't have intent or it wasn't extremely atrocious and cruel. It's not his defense that he has diminished capacity. So that's one reason why there's no substantial likelihood of a miscarriage of justice. The other reason is that the defendant wasn't entitled to the instruction in the first place because there's no evidence that he was intoxicated, that he had diminished capacity. Whether there's a lower okay. standard, sorry. Um, no, no, you answered the question. I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, any further questions of Mr. Lynch? Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, counsel. Thank you.